Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, if you're here for the unique tree species webinar with um, Jay Weiss, then you're in the right place. I just want to start uh, with just a, quick, a few quick Zoom housekeeping items. So if you could uh, remain muted during the webinar uh, and then keep your video off because so Jay has a little bit of spotty internet with the Zoom application. So uh, the more, the less video we have on, the more likely we can get Jay through uh, nice and clear. Uh, and then the slides from Jay's presentation, uh, which we pre-recorded because of uh, the, the internet, um, they will be uploaded to our website on the event page, which is on the uh, www.1kfriends.org. So following the webinar, we'll post the, the slides so you'll get a good look at all the tree species that Jay talks about today. And then following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, so please ask questions throughout the webinar uh, and then we'll get to them uh, by the end of the webinar. Uh, just a couple quick notes. We um, this. The webinar is produced in collaboration with the Dane County Tree Board and the Leafing Out webinar series. Uh, it's a webinar series to inspire care for trees. It's a webinar series for everyone. It's uh, partially funded by a, an urban forestry grant from the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And then I just wanted to uh, highlight some other partners, the Dane County Tree Board, of course. Part of their, one of their uh, mission statements is to develop educational efforts on proper tree management. So it really is a a great partnership to, to be working with the Dane County Tree Board. And you can find out more at www.treeboard.org. They got a great URL there. It looks like the, the first tree board <laughs> to get uh, to use a URL. Uh, and then some other partners that helped us uh, disseminate and spread the word about the webinar. So we just wanted to thank them, especially uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And then we have some exciting news today. So as part of our grant and part of our webinar series, Leafing Out, we have a tree giveaway. So we have 22 bare root trees to give away to webinar participants. Uh, the species include hackberry, swamp white oak, shad blow, serviceberry, uh, an elm cultivar, and then Kentucky coffee tree. So the, the trees will be uh, at the Dane County gravel bed in Madison. So you, you either have to be a Dane County resident or be willing to drive to Dane County to pick up the trees. Either way, you're gonna to have to pick up the trees and it'll be on a date to be named later, but we know it will be after April 10th. So if you're interested in uh, being included in the tree giveaway, please put your email and name in the chat and we'll get in contact with you following the webinar. So again, Dane County pickup, or if you're willing to come to Dane County to pick it up, the trees are meant to be uh, planted on private property or wherever you can put a tree. So uh, that's really exciting news. And we're, uh, we're hoping that uh, folks are interested. Okay, so uh, with that exciting news behind us, we'll start with, um, yeah, it looks like Barry Crook just asked about, you can, Contact info can be chatted uh, to, to everyone or just to me if you feel more comfortable with that. Okay, so today we have Jay Weiss with us to talk about unique tree species. Jay Weiss is principal of the Cambridge Tree Project. It's a nonprofit that he founded in 2006 with the aim of donating and establishing 1,000 additional trees in the village of Cambridge by 2020. A secondary goal of the project sought to greatly expand tree diversity in Cambridge, which grew from 35 species to 164 by 2020. Jay has been the village forester in Cambridge since 2010 and is a member of the Dane County Tree Board. Uh, and of relevance to his talk today is Jay's Cambridge Tree Trials. Uh, since the tree project began uh, right around there, Jay has been documenting survival and growth of a number of tree species and some of those he'll share with us today. So Jay, uh, thanks for being here and welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, so we wanted to start with a little bit of a warm up to get people uh, familiar with you. Um, 
and Jay doesn't have his video on just because of uh, some spotty internet. So uh, we did also pre-record the webinar, uh, his presentation. But Jay, if you don't mind, we'll start with a, a few quick warm-up questions that we've been asking each presenter. How does that sound? Uh, sure, fire away. Okay, so my first question, uh, what is your personal relationship with trees and how do you relate and connect to them in your daily life? Well, as a kid, I spent a lot of time in the woods and my entire family would go collect hickory nuts in the fall. And so I had that affinity, but at one point, um, my dad, who's actually on this, uh, this uh, webinar, I, I believe, hi dad, uh, he worked downtown in Madison, and at one point he showed me the giant elm trees that were being taken down because of Dutch elm disease. Um, he put me actually on top of one of the tree trunks that was sitting on its side, and as a kid, I remember looking down at a car uh, being on the side of that tree trunk yeah, that was cut off and along the uh, street, and I just remember feeling how massive they were looking and seeing that canopy. And he told me that an insect killed these massive trees. And I've never forgotten that. That's probably my big introduction to trees in terms of just how powerful they can be in our community and what can happen if we're not managing them, if we're not watching out for them. Yeah, well, it's really fun to hear. It, trees are one of those things that everybody seems to have a connection with, but uh, it's great to hear uh, you know, a kid's perspective of a tree, especially, you know, the, the size that they can seem to, to kids. So thanks for sharing that with us, Jay. And then two quick ones. So we have, um, uh, if you could answer what your favorite tree is, obviously you probably have different favorite trees throughout the year in different years, but right now today, what would you say is your favorite tree? Well, full, disclo uh, full disclosure, Abe, uh, Abe shared with me what these two questions were ahead of time. So I've been working on this. It took me a couple of hours, but I did narrow it down to three. Okay. Here they go. American beech, catsira tree, and sweet gum. Three trees that you'll actually get to meet today in the presentation. Mm, nice. Yeah, I mean beach is another one that's got to be one of my favorites just because of, well you'll find out later i won't give anything away but you'll mm -hmm. find out how, why they're so special and then finally we're doing a team coniferous versus team deciduous uh um i guess contest on our webinar right now well i won't share it with you right now but if you could choose deciduous or coniferous which one well, I'd have to say deciduous because my favorite trees are mostly deciduous, though I really like hemlocks. So, well, there, I've added a fourth favorite tree. There you go. <laughs> you better shut me up now. <laughs> okay, so deciduous, that's interesting because now we have three, all three presenters have chosen team deciduous, so we're still waiting on our first team difference. Uh, Okay, but so we pre-recorded the the web and, or Jay's presentation, so we'll start that right here, and then please send questions in the chat, and uh, we'll get to those at the end of the recording. Uh, I just want to give a special shout out to my mom, Karen Lennox. She's on the webinar. She, I was asking my family members what they would like to learn about during the webinar series, and she said she wanted to know how fast trees grow. So today's the perfect webinar for my mom to learn about that. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it, mom. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen and uh, you guys enjoy the presentation and we'll be back for questions in a little bit. Hello everyone and uh, thanks for tuning in over your lunch hour and I uh, do realize that competing with Jimmy John and Jersey Mike in this time slot is a tall order. So I'll aim to keep things moving for you while introducing some fast growing and tenacious shade trees over the next half hour. Now, most of the trees you'll meet today will grow in virtually any soil. 
I call this the subdivision series of trees because all of them have proven their moxie in our tree trials, succeeding in uh, open exposed areas where uh, thin and poorly drained clay soils are so commonly found. Now, if you don't have those conditions on your property, if you live in an older neighborhood, that's fine because your trees will just grow that much faster. Um, also, you'll learn over the next half hour a couple of pro tips uh, to increase survival and growth rates of, of any tree you plant. And by following these tips, your trees should grow twice as fast under most conditions. First off, a little about me. I'm uh, Jay Weiss with the Cambridge Tree Project. The Tree Project is a nonprofit I founded 15 years ago to uh, donate and establish 1,000 additional living trees in our village forest by the year 2020. And here is a, a picture of us planting that 1,000th additional living tree, um, a year ahead of schedule, actually, in 2019. I also happen to be village forester in Cambridge, where we've ventured to grow more than 200 different species of trees over the past 15 years. And throughout that time, I've kept meticulous records of each tree we've planted. The ongoing analysis of these records is called the Cambridge Tree Trials. And you can see here in this Excel file, annual height measurements taken of some of the trees we've planted. Data collection started way back in 2006 and has carried forward every year since then. And here's a quick summary of what I have. So in total, there are records for just over 1,200 trees. And the records include any number of attributes for each tree, you know, its status, is it dead or alive, the height. And I do make notes where it makes sense to build a better understanding how planting location affects growth and survival. For example, which trees will grow in shade or maybe even heavy shade uh, in open, exposed, windy areas, poor soil, flooding, etc. Anyway, back to the 1,200 trees we've planted, I can tell you which ones lived. And I can tell you how fast they've grown because I've taken over 7,000 growth measurements over this time, leading to over 5,300 calculations, actual growth figures. And overall, if you're wondering, 83% uh, of the trees we've planted are still alive. And roughly our typical tree grew around 18 inches annually over this period. All right, uh, one more thing before we get rolling on the tree profiles. Nearly all of the pictures you'll see in the presentation were taken by me in our village forest. Uh, some were also taken in Madison and some at various arboreta from around the country. But let's start off um, with a tree known for exceptionally fast growth. So last summer, someone sent me a picture they're kind of like this, and they were asking, why is it that some maple leaves get to be so large? But the th thing is, these are actually not maple leaves. They're from a sycamore tree. And sycamores are native. They grow as close to Madison as the Avon Bottoms, which is a wildlife area just west of Beloit along the Sugar River. Now, this next slide I just love to share. Pictured on both sides is the same tree, one of the fastest growing trees I've measured. On the left, you see a sycamore in 2006, the year I planted it. It was six feet tall. On the right, you can see it's grown quite a bit. Uh, by last fall, over the past 14 years, it had grown from six to 55 feet tall. So that's 43 inches of growth annually over this period. Now you can see in this picture that the property owner is doing a nice job of mulching around the tree's trunk, but this tree wasn't regularly watered 
after its initial planting and it still grew that quickly. And by the way, it's critically important whenever you plant a new tree to water it heavily. The uh, inaugural watering, as I like to call it, actually settles in the soil around your tree's roots, maximizing their ability to uptake uh, you know, water and nutrients. Uh, myself, as pictured here, I fashion uh, that small soil moat of sorts around the planting hole, and then I flood the area twice, immediately after planting. So I let the water soak in, takes around five minutes, then I flood it a second time. And then I mulch the tree and I leave the moat so it continues collecting rainwater for another couple of years. Now, back to that fast growing sycamore, imagine this tree in your yard uh, breaking the sun's intensity on a hot August afternoon. And, and you're asking yourself, you know, why, why isn't our air conditioning running all of the time like it used to? Sycamore will shade a single story home in just over five years. For a two story home, 10 years. They're also great for areas with standing water or if your property would have a high water table, which leads to dampness in your basement. Large trees can actually draw down the water table over a smaller area, such as your side yard or backyard. Uh, we've planted a lot of sycamores. The one you see here is pictured in the lowest point in our village. It's actually a floodplain, as you can see in this picture, uh, and it's inundated every spring. It was five feet tall when planted 14 years ago. Now. 45 feet tall. So in this case, we have 34 inches of annual growth. And I'd, I'd like to add, this tree tolerated minus 32 uh, back in January of 2019 for the polar vortex. That's an actual air temperature, not a wind chill. So they're very, very hardy trees. Um, you're probably wondering, what does a sycamore look like up close? And here you can see on the left, uh, it's beautiful, white, exfoliating bark. This tree happens to be located just off Monroe Street in Madison, bordering Lake Wingra. And on the right are the typical maple-styled leaves of a sycamore, uh, pictured midsummer. And finally, I'd like to wrap up our sycamore discussion. Um, this is actually the state champion sycamore, which uh, grows along Military Road up in Fond du Lac. This tree is estimated to be around 200 years old. And interestingly, it's not even the largest sycamore with regard to its trunk circumference in our state. But you can see here that this tree is massive with time. So they, they reach 100 feet tall and up to 125 feet wide. So just be sure your property has the room to accommodate a tree this large if you're thinking of planting one. Finally, here's a sycamore fun fact for you. Their wood has been used for hundreds of years and is still used to make butcher blocks. And historically, sycamore wood was used to make buttons, hence its nickname, buttonwood. So if quick shade is your objective, I can't re recommend a better tree that will grow exceedingly fast, but won't break apart like so many other fast growing trees, such as uh, willows, uh, silver maples, poplars, et cetera. And speaking of trees that tolerate standing water, next up is one of the few trees that can literally grow in a swamp. So <laughs> you might be laughing at the size of this street tree, but hear me out. Uh, this tree was pictured the first year it was planted and you can see uh, it was really small around three feet tall but only eight years later it, it already reached 20 feet high so that's 28 inches of annual growth through that period but here it is again last fall and it's 32 feet high so a small three foot tree can be fairly substantial in a short amount of time. In this particular case, 
the long-term growth average was 24 inches annually. Now, culturally, this tree is lucky. Um, it's located in good soil. It was watered early in its life. Uh, and it had mulching every year, its entire life. And interestingly, through our tree trials, here comes your pro tip. Um, we've found that trees mulched regularly grow 50% faster than those that weren't. And that's because the tree gets the water and the nutrients that the grass would have skimmed off if it was allowed to grow up around the area of the trunk. Mulch also helps moderate uh, temperature and moisture extremes, which means less stress, especially for a younger tree. So second pro tip uh, for another 50% faster growth, water your trees if it doesn't rain for a week. So taken together, mulch and regular watering will double most trees' growth rates. So just a few more pictures of uh, bald cypress. You can see here it's orange fall color. So bald cypress is one of the few conifers that drops all of its leaves in fall. Um, another one, a native, um, is the eastern larch, otherwise known as a tamarack tree, if you've heard of those. On the right, you see the typical bald cypress bark um, and otherwise kind of a fissured and reddish tint. And here's another great thing about bald cypress. They're much hardier than you'd expect. So these trees pictured here on the left are part of a grove of bald cypress located in the same floodplain that I mentioned the sycamore was growing in. Again, 32 below, not a wind chill. And no dieback was noted on any of our bald cypress trees. Now, let me ask you, do you hate raking leaves? If so, <laughs> bald cypress feature needles that fall in literally don't need raking. Uh, on the right, you can see a small one inch fruit. For a conifer, they're very small and they actually, they break apart when they're mature. So not a hassle whatsoever in terms of cleanup. Now, just like sycamore, I have a fun fact for you uh, with bald cypress. They're known to be incredibly long lived. And there's actually a tree in North Carolina that was recently found to be 2,626 years old. So it's the oldest tree in the Eastern half of North America, almost as old as the record oldest giant sequoia out in California. Now, next up, um, why would I be recommending a tree that for 50 years you've been told to never plant? <laughs> and where do I begin? These pictures were taken on the same street down in Waukegan, just across the border back in the 60s. And look at the incredible vase shape on the left that uh, distinguishes American elm from virtually any other shade tree. And on the right is the aftermath. Uh, once the elms were removed uh, following their death to Dutch elm disease. And for me, the value of this uh, enveloping canopy uh, on the left that elms orchestrated over American streets historically just can't be overstated. I mean, there's the, the obvious, the tangible, you know, energy savings or stormwater runoff mitigation, um, higher property values, but maybe even more meaningful are the non-tangible elements of the canopy, uh, comfort, community, aesthetics, pride of place, you know, I mean, and look, where would you rather live? So tree people for many years have assumed and asserted uh, <laughs> that trees can reduce crime, but now data from studies is starting to back the assertion up, conclusively linking an inverse relationship between crime and tree canopies. So is it correlation, causation? Uh, they don't know for sure, but early evidence suggests that people hang out for longer periods of time in the shade provided by trees. Unfortunately though, today nearly all original American elms are gone. 
but they are being planted again. And that's because the elms planted today are hybrids and they resist Dutch elm disease. And pictured here are actually some of the earliest disease resistant elms. They're probably around 50 years old. You get an idea, these, are, these trees are very fast growing and look at the shape, the form of the trees. Now we've had success planting this new wave of resistant elm trees throughout our village over the past 20 years. And not only are they not dying, but they're growing quickly, even in the worst conditions. So here's one example. This tree, when planted, was nine feet tall, and now 38 feet tall, 12 years later. It wasn't watered, it wasn't mulched, yet it's still a, averaged very good annual growth, typical for an elm. They're also known for being tough, surviving even the worst soil conditions, including wet areas, um, and they're great choices for, for subdivisions because they deal so well with compaction. And beyond their elegant form and fast growth, uh, elm trees also have ornamental appeal. So on the left, you can see the glossy leaves of an elm cultivar. Uh, and on your right is the uh, handsome uh, bark. And the other thing is they have nice fall color. Typically elms uh, have yellow fall color, but some of the cultivars um, have a vibrant red like the one you see, you see here. Now, elms are an excellent choice if you want shade within the first 10 years of planting a tree. Not quite as fast growing as sycamore, but something that you will make a noticeable difference planting in a short period of time. Our next tree uh, probably has the most unusual name of any tree you'll learn about today, the Kentucky coffee tree. And you might be thinking, wow, I can grow coffee beans right here in Wisconsin on a tree, cool. Uh, well, actually, no, you can't do that because they're not really coffee beans. They just look somewhat similar. And early pioneers didn't know any better and they did actually roast this tree's seeds as a coffee substitute, which is where the name comes from. But as you can see here, this species is beautiful. Um, you can you just see, look at the form, open, airy, and it looks this way because it has a very, very small leaflets and kind of a more minimalist branching structure. These traits allow more sunlight to reach the ground so it's easier to grow your grass. Now, beyond its beauty, there are other reasons to plant Kentucky coffee tree. For starters, it's native to Wisconsin, although very uncommon. And there's actually some concern about it possibly becoming extinct in the wild. And that's because its seed pods were primarily distributed by mastodons, the uh, elephant type beasts that haven't been seen in what, 10,000 years. And besides being native, coffee tree also has a local connection. The second largest specimen ever measured in back in 1986 grows just southeast of Madison near Lake Koshkanong. So again, 112 feet tall, it's a big tree. Now they also have a nice ornamental flaking bark shown on the left, um, especially on smaller branches. And on the right are the large purple turning dark brown seed pods. And you've probably seen these uh, given how common coffee trees have become as street and park trees over the past decade. Female coffee trees do produce these four to eight inch long seed pods every year. Uh, the pods house the coffee beans that were mentioned earlier. And the truth is, some people do object to them, mostly when they fall to the ground in late spring. But a pod free male cultivar, or actually a couple, um, are being propagated and are becoming more commonly available. On the left, the coffee trees rose scented, I'm not kidding, spring flowers. Um, I've actually experienced the smell. It's, it's up there with the best magnolia. Very, very uh, wonderful fragrance. And on the right, you see the disease and <clears throat> insect resistant leaves. Um, they look great all summer and in the fall. 
they turn an excellent yellow fall color. Now this tree is actually located uh, at the Greenway Stations Shopping Center out in Middleton, uh, very close to Jersey Mike, actually. Um, the trees are commonly used now for parking lot islands because they're so tough, uh, able to thrive in areas with minimal amounts of lousy soil. Um, they're also fast growing, um, over two feet annually in good soil. Uh, and even more than that, if you're good at watering and mulching. Now, overall, uh, this native offers a great uh, airy, open, graceful form, uh, interesting aesthetics, and let's face it, it's, it has a tough disposition. Uh, it's another great choice for virtually any sunny spot in your yard. Now, as for my next tenacious tree, um, so much is made of fall color, right? We all love our red maples, but this tree provides the best fall color festival of any tree that grows in our area. It's a sweet gum and it has great impact because each leaf on the same tree picks a different color and runs with it. So you heard me correctly, all of the leaves shown here are from the same tree. Now just look at this, sweet gum grown me natively um, as far north as about central Illinois, but several cultivars are fully hardy in our area and I've listed them here. Annual growth um, in better soils, above average at right around two feet a year. Um, otherwise, even in the worst soils, uh, sweet gum will grow a foot a year or more. Uh, they also have an interesting ornamental kind of corky looking bark shown on the left. And on the right, you can see the lustrous, glossy star-shaped leaves. These leaves have no insect or disease issues, and they actually look great right up to the fall when they turn uh, that, those incredible colors. Now, there's always a but. Uh, sweet gums have seed pods shown here on the left and they do persist over winter months and then they fall to the ground in very late winter and early spring so somewhat less objectionable um they won't cut you if you step on them they're about an inch but they will remind you you know not to do that again um the pods are actually quite popular with crafters now uh, they're used for floral arrangements and holiday wreaths and whatnot now uh, on the Right, you see the form of a younger tree. This one happens to be growing over two feet a year. Um, the fun fact I have for you with sweet gum is that this tree was historically used to flavor chewing gum. So there's your name. And the sap from sweet gum is still used in perfumes, in cosmetics, and in tobacco. Next up. Uh, one of the biggest requests at our annual tree sales, birch. Now we sell a lot of birch and, you know, it's easy to love the decorative bark and the exceptional yellow fall color of a birch tree. But did you know some birch trees are much better suited as yard trees than others? And in a general sense, most white bark birches are bad choices to plant in suburban yards, unless you have absolutely the perfect conditions in your lawn. And that would have to look something like this with morning and midday sun, afternoon shade, and deep free draining garden soil. So if you don't have all of that going on in your yard, I'd recommend not planting a white bark birch tree. Really they're best left up north they just, they struggle with heat when they're planted this far south. And oftentimes they succumb to disease and insect damage if they're not located in a cool, sunny microclimate. So, and this is why you see so few large white bark birches in our area. However, one native birch that you can grow pretty much anywhere with a lot of sun is a river birch. And as the name suggests, uh, this tree 
grows along rivers and in low wet areas that can be uh, flooded, especially in the spring. This is a much tougher tree than a white birch, but you don't get the classic white colored bark. Instead, it features what you see here, which is a, this beautiful exfoliating cream and salmon colored bark. And I'm sure you've seen these. They've become one of the most popular landscape trees because they're so tenacious. And as you can see, they have the traditional excellent yellow birch fall color. Now we've found that river birch um, is exceptionally fast growing. On average, our trees are, are, are gaining 32 inches annually. And in good soil, we've seen growth rates over three feet annually as juveniles. So this tree is easy to grow in just about any soil type, provided you have a lot of sun. Next up, we have Dawn Redwood. So this tree is very similar to bald cypress in terms of its appearance and culture, but it's faster growing. So looking at annual growth, Dawn Redwood grows 50% faster than bald cypress. And in the best conditions, we're seeing just under three feet of annual growth without watering. So culturally, like bald cypress, this tree is tough. It's tolerant to flooding and drought and compacted soils. And just quickly to show you, give you an idea of what a dawn cypress looks like. Uh, very similar to bald cypress, attractive red fissured bark. And on the right, you can see this is actually a great tree for climbing if you have kids because of its lateral branching. Uh, and here you can see uh, it, it features the same bald cypress type, no rake leaves, right? They're just small leaflets that, that fall to the ground and literally decompose and fertilize your grass. Um, and like bald cypress, very small cones for a conifer, only one inch. This is a, a, an extreme close up of the cone. Um, this tree will grow quickly anywhere there's a lot of sun. So next, we're going to consider a tree that works especially well in older, more established neighborhoods where there tends to be more shade. So red oak, and, and this is a very common forest tree in our area. And it's, I think it's so common that we tend to overlook it um, as a lawn tree. And the biggest reason to plant red oak, or any other oak for that matter, is that they're survivors. And despite the presence of oak wilt in Wisconsin since the 1940s, most of the oldest, tallest trees in established neighborhoods are oaks. So they easily outlive the more commonly planted maples and birches. And let's look at the tree picture here just for a minute. So at first glance, it probably doesn't make that much of an impression. But when you start looking closer at this picture, notice how small and intimate <laughs> It makes a two-story house look next to it. And here's another picture of the same tree showing just how big this tree is. So this specimen was routinely pruned. This was someone who really did a nice job of maintaining their tree. And you can see it actually has the classic vase shape of an American elm. So I was reading real estate studies estimate that a mature shade tree adds 10% to a home's value. And in this case, clearly it's saving the resident money uh, in reduced energy use due to the shade it provides. This happens to be sited immediately south of the house. So they're optimizing its, uh, the coverage it provides in terms of shade. Now, uh, to be sure to, we, uh, we plant a lot of oaks and I knew they were shade tolerant, but I didn't realize how shade tolerant they were until we started under planting them uh, next to ash trees that we were going to eventually take down. And this is one of the few trees that will happily grow in shade or even dense shade. It's the only oak that has that characteristic. Um, we've used uh, these trees in heavy shade and they've performed really well um, despite not receiving the sun. So you can see growth rates suppressed, but in sun, 
Red oaks are relatively fast growing trees. We're recording 20 inches annually. Now, some people question planting oaks because they worry that acorns are messy. But when you really step back from it and look at the problem, that mess occurs for a couple of days a year, every couple of years, because they don't have bumper crops of acorns every year. And the thing to remember is that as quickly as the acorns appear, they're gone. You know, squirrels quickly confiscate them and they cache them for our long winters. So your oak fun fact is that squirrels with a food supply are less likely to be obnoxious and eat your flower bulbs in the spring. So there's that. And by the way, look at the fall color. Um, don't, you wouldn't expect this every year on a red oak the way you would with a, a red maple, but on good years, red oaks really deliver. Now let's consider a tree that really stands out in late spring, early summer every year with an incredible floral display. So this is a catulpa. And this tree is said to have the most attractive flowers of any North American tree. So up close, they look like orchids. But be warned, uh, catulpa has massive leaves uh, shown here on the left. They can be a foot long and a foot tall. They're, it's a tropical appearance and it's not for everyone. It's also difficult to incorporate into landscape scenarios because basically it visually overwhelms whatever it's next to. And on the right, you've seen them, the notoriously massive Catulpa cigar type bean pods. Um, they start producing these things around 15 years age. Uh, and let's face it, people do notice them. They're a mess and they require cleanup every spring uh, because you can't mow over them. But Catulpa, despite all of this, is a survivor. We've planted 26 of them across our village in the worst possible conditions. None of them have died. And growth rates on average 28 inches annually. So, and here you see um, probably, I don't know the age of this tree, but I would put it at 20 to 30 years. Um, very quickly, you can make a bold landscape statement with a catalpa. Um, just yeah, be sure to have a good rake uh, standing by and some patience. Now for our last tenacious tree, you'll meet a family of trees actually that includes two commonly known trees, buckeye and horse chestnut. And these are both members of the Aeschylus tree family and taken as a whole, they're incredibly tenacious. Our experience shows 99% survival of the 68 trees we've planted throughout our village in this family. But beyond this, what makes them so appealing are the incredible flowers like the uh, beautiful examples shown here, which are from an Ohio Buckeye. Now also notice the palmately compound leaves, which isn't a common leaf form. Um, very attractive, uh, especially in early summer when, when they're in flower. Um, this is, in general, Buckeyes have yellow flowers, but not always. The red buckeye, of course, has red flowers, and this is a very attractive tree. Um, it's also the fastest growing buckeye species. Uh, we've recorded 18 inches annually of uh, growth in our trials. Uh, and red buckeyes, and this is true of all buckeyes, will grow in shade, including deep all day shade. Something, as I mentioned with red oaks, is unusual in the tree world. Now, most horse chestnuts, however, unlike buckeyes, have white flowers. The tree pictured here, um, the common horse ch chestnut is the most common member of the family. Uh, you see it, especially in older neighborhoods and on campus and municipal grounds. Uh, actually, there's a massive horse chestnut on the top of Bascom Hill, and you won't miss it uh, in June when it's in flower. And just a quick word on names, 
So in America, we call them buckeyes and they produce nuts like the one pictured on the left here. In Europe though, the virtually identical nuts are called horse chestnuts, which are pictured on the right. Now these are different species within the same family. All members of this family produce these nuts and most of them have the spikes you see here, but not all. And these nuts are messy, but again, not as messy as you might guess because squirrels confiscate them. In many cases, they take them right off the trees before they even fall to the ground. So the other thing to keep in mind is that buckeyes and horse chestnuts are not edible like the American chestnut. Now this is just a quick sidebar. Here you can see an American chestnut tree and you can see the husks have really sharp spikes that will poke. You can see that it, you need a pliers to get out the edible chestnuts. However, American chestnuts, and the reason I won't be talking much about them today, are not tenacious. The population was decimated across most of the eastern half of the country over the past hundred years because of chestnut blight. But at one time, chestnut was actually one of the most common forest trees in the eastern US. And a fun fact about chestnut is the largest remaining stand of American chestnuts in the world is located near La Crosse. So the grove is estimated to contain between three and 5,000 trees. And it survives because it's disjunct to the tree's native range. And the fungus hasn't jumped the geography to infect these trees, although there's some word that they're now being infected. Um, there's a lot of interest in breeding blight resistant American chestnuts, and we do grow them successfully in our village Cambridge uh, forest. Now back to horse chestnuts, just to wrap this up. The most beautiful and popular member of this family is actually a hybrid of the red buckeye and a common horse chestnut called, not surprisingly, the red horse chestnut. Pictured here is a Fort McNair red horse chestnut cultivar, which started off back in 2006 at four feet tall. 14 years later, it's 23 feet tall. So this tree had perfect conditions, lots of mulch, lots of water, and it's not growing that quickly. Um, but again, other than red buckeye, this group of trees is considered slower growing. I'd also add that red horse chestnuts are crowd pleasers. People see them in flower and they want them. It's one of our most requested terrace trees in town. And they're also very popular at our annual tree sales. Anyway, to summarize our discussion of buckeye horse chestnuts, uh, the family. These trees offer exceptionally interesting flowers, and I would say that no other tree in our area has the floral appeal of the, these trees. What people don't know, though, is just how incredibly tough these trees are with regard to survival. Now, this concludes my subdivision series of trees. Next, I'm going to make a brief introduction to three trees that require good garden soil. And as such, they really shouldn't be considered for newer neighborhoods. But our first selection is a beautiful and fast growing member of the Magnolia family. This is a tulip tree, now pictured here the year it was planted. Now these trees uh, have incredible spring flowers and they're with time majestic trees. And they're actually in the Magnolia family and they grow as close natively as the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan but they're perfectly hardy in our area. So let's take a look at just how quickly this tree grows. Here we are in 2006, seven feet. Um, by 2013, it had reached uh, 24 feet. And by 2018, this tree was 37 feet tall. So averaging 32 inches of annual growth. But quick growth is only part of uh, this tree's story. Take a look at the incredibly beautiful summer flowers. Tulip tree as a name is often misapplied to various ornamental magnolia trees, flowering magnolias. But this tree, while it's related, has flowers that truly look like tulips on a tree. Uh, and they arrive within 10 years of the tree being planted. So no waiting around. 
And then one more nice thing about tulip trees as these they have these unusually shaped disease free leaves and shown here is the irresistibly buttery yellow fall color. Now this tree with time is massive reaching 80 feet tall about half as wide under landscape conditions. The state record tulip tree located in down in row is just over 90 feet tall. Now the two trees pictured here um, are part of a stand of trees in North Carolina in the uh, Joyce Kilmer National Forest. These trees, some are 200 feet tall. So overall, if you have good soil and mostly sunny conditions, you just can't beat this tree's combination of ornamental features and of course it's fast growth. Next up, uh, meet the most shade tolerant tree native to Wisconsin, American beech. So this tree grows natively along Lake Michigan from Milwaukee north, stretching uh, into Door County and then Shawano and beyond uh, to the northwest. And you can see here in this picture, it's hallmark features, uh, golden persistent leaves, they hang on all winter long, uh, smooth bark, even on the oldest branches, perfectly smooth bark. And then with time, a massive spreading profile. Now, this tree wouldn't be considered fast growing over the long term, but juvenile growth is actually fairly quick, about 18 inches a year, even in shady conditions. So here's a close up of American Beach's uh, perfectly smooth uh, ornamental silver bark. Um, and again, it stays smooth even as the trees age. Very unusual. If you've ever watched Downton Abbey or any other British period drama, you'll see a lot of beech trees. Although most of those are the European beech, which also tend to have lead red colored leaves, which you might have seen very commonly spotted in uh, English gardens. And here you can see uh, beech trees interesting summer leaves and they're developing beech nuts. Beech nuts are edible and they're flavorful, very tasty. Now, if you have good deep topsoil and sun or shade, even deep shade. This is one of the best trees to underplant a tree that you plan on eventually moving. People are doing this under ash trees, uh, knowing eventually they'll come down. Now our last profile will introduce you to what, what's considered by tree snobs anyway, one of the most beautiful and desirable specimen trees known. So this is a Katsura tree. And you're looking at a middle-aged tree. Um, and this tree is known for long life. Um, it's very low maintenance and it really holds itself well in any season. They just, they do everything right. So you can see here it's graceful form and it has a very fine texture, especially in uh, the middle age of the tree. And you can see how full the branching is and how the richly textured small leaves from this distance almost suggest the air of a spruce or a fir tree. Um, and then shown here is a 15 year old Katsira tree. So in this stage of its life, it tends to be narrow uh, and more tightly branched. Um, again, also more formal character at this stage, but there's no question this tree is fast growing. We found young Katsiras add between two and three feet annually. Um, uh, in a good year. They do need to be watered. They do need to be mulched. Um, this tree was eight feet tall in 2006, and now it's just under 30 feet tall. So that's just under 30 inches annually um, of growth. Uh, again, regular applications of water and mulch, critical. Um, they do not tolerate drought. So they require supplemental watering throughout their establishment phase. And that could be a couple of years or maybe even up to five. Your investment pays off though, once you see this tree succeeding in your own yard. Now here's a close up of Katsura's um, leaf. Uh, these are disease free. They have a round shape and they tend to flicker in the wind, almost like a quaking aspen. Um, they emerge reddish purple. Uh, and they look just great all year. So they have incredible resistance to all known insects and foliar diseases, including Japanese beetles. 
And then a nice aspect of Cancera trees is their shade tolerance. So similar to red oak and beech, we underplanted a couple of our larger ash trees throughout our village with Catseras. And they've almost grown at the same rate in shade as we see in sunny spots. They also maintain their dense branching in shade, which is unusual because most trees tend to become leggy when they're reaching for the sun. Uh, here, another ornamental aspect of Catsera, it's shaggy, rugged bark. So this tree is a multi-stem um, form of Catsera, which is always an option because they tend to send multiple branches out at the base of the trunk. And if you want a single trunk tree, just trim off um, the competing trunks uh, a couple a year or one a year if you have only two or three. And finally, a uh, glimpse of Catsera trees reliable apricot, orangey, yellow fall color. So if you have good deep garden soil and a good watering bucket, you will love to grow this tree. All right, so this wraps up your introduction to some fast growing unique shade trees. Now Abe will open the session for any questions and here's my contact information. Thanks again for tuning in. Well, Jay, that was great. Thank you for uh, doing that for us. Uh, if you want to just, if you could post that email in the chat and then the phone number, just so people have it, I wanted to turn it off. We're getting close to one o'clock. I mean, first of all, I just want to say how incredible this project is. First of all, the forethought to, um, you know, to start collecting data right away. And then for people that have the assurance of the data behind your recommendations, it's just, uh, it's really great. Um, if you want, we don't have, it looks like you answered the only question in the chat so far. Um, but if you just wanted to speak to like, you know, how you, how you thought to, to start collecting data beforehand, just kind of the, the basis behind the tree trials. Well, I, I would guess the uh, biggest reason was I didn't know what to expect. And we were trying so many unusual species. And I wanted to remember if they performed well, because that way we would continue planting them. So it really was in the context of our own community. And as I was collecting more and more data, I thought it meant made a lot of sense to share it with others. And by the way, if you want to email me, uh, the email is posted there. I'm more than happy to share uh, my tree trials exhibit, which I do update annually. So you have the growth and survival rates um, of right around 50 trees for survival. And then I have growth rates uh, for closer to 100 different species of trees. Awesome. Amazing. Uh, we have a question about mulch from Frank Lenock. That happens to be my dad. And hopefully, I guess our parents are both on, so hopefully we made them proud today, Jay. Um, <laughs> do you have any mulch recommendations, for example, type, depth, and distance from the trunk? Well, the secret is to use organic mulch. So bark, wood, um, not the best idea to use stone or gravel. And then generally speaking, um, a couple of inches will do, but don't mulch right up to the trunk itself. And the reason is that you don't want moisture to collect right next to the trunk because it will introduce decay potentially. And as far as how far out to go, um, ideally you would go as far out as the, the, the distance of the uh, tree's branches. And that gets to be a, a lot as they get taller, but it's the best thing for the tree to have as much water and nutrients as it can. So keeping the grass away from your tree trunk is a really good idea. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Dina Grass is wondering if you have any trees that are planted on a hill or maybe she's wondering if you have any notes specifically about trees that are planted on a hill. You know, I don't because we're not that hilly and we don't plant trees on hills as, as a rule, just because it's difficult to mow around them. Uh -huh. But you might consider your local forest as would be a great indicator. My sense is that most trees probably are more than happy to grow on a hill if it's the right moisture and 
cultural regime. You know, if it's the sun they want and the soil conditions they want. But that's a good question. I, I, I don't know really where to point you in terms of examples, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay. Well, I think the, the local forest areas is a good place to start. Uh, and then Julie Fitzpatrick was wondering if we could get some more info on the Cambridge Tree Project tree sale. It looks like somebody else just posted in the chat that www.cambridgetreeproject.org. Is that the right place? Uh, it is, yeah, that is our website and we're on Facebook, but most of the good information is on the website and we do have uh, pro tree profiles, uh, pictures and growth rates are all shared on that website, as well awesome. as contact awesome. information. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, this is just such an amazing project and we're really lucky to have you uh, here today. So thanks, Jay. We're, we're past one. I'll give people just a quick second to send any more questions. Otherwise, Jay, if you had any last words you wanted to mention. Um, no, thank you for everyone for tuning in, though. Uh, this has a, been a real treat for me because I'm able to kind of collect the information and for the first time, put it into a presentation form and, and share it with the community. So I appreciate the opportunity. Abe. Yeah, thanks for thanks for being here, Jay. And then just um, one other note. The slides will be available again on the event page on our 1kfriends.org website. So you can look there. They should be up by the end of the day. And then there's going to be a YouTube recording that I'm also going to send to Jay. So eventually it'll probably probably either be on his website or Facebook page. Um, so and then uh, you know we'll try and get a list of, you know of all the species at least on the event page that that Jay posted today. Barry Crook said, thanks everyone. This was really great. So we'll sign off there. Jay, thanks again for, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And go to cambridgetreeproject.org and uh, buy some trees from, from Jay. Thanks everybody.